and uh, have the caption shown on your own uh, screen as uh, the transcripts are also available there. All right. So welcome everyone to another episode of the Bio 10 Segra Tea Party. And this is episode uh, featuring today, episode seven of Leonid Bloom's Everything I Know series, where he interviews um, Steve Levin on his journey to, uh, I don't know, developing <laughs> Bio 10 Segrity. Um, now, today, Leonid's on with us, but he's having camera trouble. So we just have a screenshot of him. Um, so we'll uh, we'll not, not let that bother us. That's and... it. You'll see more than enough of me on, on there, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Leonid. And so we like to start with an opening toast. Um, so I'm just going to toast sort of biotensegrity fans, new and and seasoned. Um, <laughs> there are so many people here who knew about biotensegrity long before I did, um, like Michelle Tarento. And um, just there are those of us who have been in at it, in it for well over a decade. I know Steve Schafferman, Steve Geiger. Um, Mariana Barreto has been at it for over 20 years, a lot longer than I have, but, um, and so is Leonid, but anyway, we also come together with a kind of joyful welcoming to, um, someone like Lewis Smith, who's with us today, who's kind of just beginning to discover it and put it together with his raw thing. So to all bio tensegrity friends. Cheers. Cheers. <clears throat> okay, and what I'm going to do is a screen share because we're going to see this fabulous. So, so we might remind them to just turn off the camera. Oh, while please, we are presenting Mariana, this. jump right in and do so. Yes, uh, so while we're presenting, just turn off your camera, okay? <laughs> Thanks so much. Here we go. We see it okay? I am turned off. Well, dear friends, we are continuing everything I know about the integrity series with Dr. Stephen Levin. And I think that we really covered a lot of interesting ground in the previous episodes as we were going through both the journey of the anxiety and the discovery and then the journey of finding the personal attempts to sort of falsify and disprove it to be able to really approach it on the say at least as a personal scientific and uh, enterprise and this is where we ended up with the previous episodes and i think it's time to pick it up from there and go on so we were talking about the hundred plus experiments that you made observing whether the joints whether the joint space closes and this uh, like the, the whole variety of experiments that you did um, around it including that operating on the orderly or uh, in the, uh, having the arthroscopic techniques uh, really helping you in this uh, inquiry so let's kind of take it further and um, you know let's maybe relieve it a bit and give yourself a bit of a let's get a bit of a summary right because as far as i see those five years between 1975 and 1980 they even in your mind they kind of blurred and blended together in one just kind of oops convoluted thing right yes yeah because you know i was a active clinician doing you know making a living 
uh, covering the emergency room, and I was also playing around with all these, you know, things that were completely novel to me. I had no idea. I hadn't heard about a lot of this stuff. So I was learning about Tensegri. I did all this books on nature and patterns in nature. I, uh, I started reading uh, uh, math books to try and get it straight. I go into, I'm not sure if it was, um, at that time I went fractals, I think uh, Mandelbrot's fractals came out about that. It was then. 1978. Yeah, and he wrote a book in the 1980s, I believe. And yeah, so, so, the, the, so about the well, that, that yeah, she so became famous later, but the first book seventy seven or seventy eight. Right, but I got kind of, I started reading about him. Oh wow! Then. So you bumped into that even that oh, early? Yeah. Oh yeah, but I I was really digging. Okay, that hmm, because at that point the fractal thing was yeah, quite an this obscurity. Was, this was in the nineteen eighties. I you know, I well yeah, the late seventies. Mm. In the early 80s, I started getting the fractals too, so I was trying to understand how this all came together. But that was, let me, let's just do this. So, but that was your personal journey, right? Yes. But at the same time, when once it was the personal journey, I guess a person who is in this type of the situation gets into, you know, there's a certain urge and each to start to share and uh, speak about it and see what the others say. Am I correct? Right. That's uh, human nature, right? So, first people you were talking to were your orthopedic colleagues. Uh, uh, yes, except they were not at all accepted. So, I started talking to the physical therapy people. Um, so, you, your orthopedic colleagues, what was what was the thing? You know, they didn't see the practicality in it? Yeah, it was, again, mechanics are not their big thing, mm -hmm. it, at least mechanics from the standpoint of scientific approach to the mechanics, their interest is, is you know, is strictly the carpentry end of it. So yeah. the new techniques and... Uh... Right, so they're busy hammering and screwing screws and, and sawing bones and <laughs> setting fractures, but they're really not inter interested in the basic science underlying it. It just is not what they do. Um, they're much more practical in their approach to what's happening. Okay, so that means that that was not really the circle that you went into, but what were the people who were more All right. well, I interested? Start, I started talking to the physical therapy people, uh, mostly the physical therapists in the area. I would give various talks to the physical therapy group. Um, there was um, a physiatrist at uh, Alexandria Hospital, Frank Winger, who was also a rolfer. And so I sort of, he, would, he became very interested in, and talked to me about Ida Rolf and her relationship to Tensegrity, not knowing there was any prior, you know, it was all new to me. But he says, well, Ida Rolf had talked about Tensegrity. Oh, um, but wait, Ida Rolf, was she alive at that point? I don't believe so. Ah, I think it was but or, anyway, so you, if, you, so the, the, whatever the institute showed, it was still under, strongly under her influence. So she, if she passed away, it was oh, not, yeah. not, wasn't it, long ago. No, it wasn't long before that. So, but she, you know, there was already an Ida Rolf Institute and some Ida Rolf journals out there mm -hmm. and some people who had written some stuff. And I got introduced, I learned of, of other people who have talked about Tensegri, not quite in the depth that I had, but related, Ida Ralph talked about, um, well, she was very interested in spinal alignment, in the yeah. body alignment, and Ling saying that, from my understanding, Buckminster Fuller and Ida Ralph were in Philadelphia at the same time and had interacted. You and mean they lived or they just... They, they lived in, in Philadelphia at the same time or and they interacted because several years later when I met Buckminster Fuller and talked to him, he brought up Ida Ralph. He says, well, Ida Ralph had a similar idea. Oh, so, so but so, he, she had this similar idea, so maybe, so probably she communicated to him when, like in the 60s even. Uh, possibly, 
you know, okay. gonna, because there was this, because she used to talk about tensegrity, but she talked about it in a different way. And she talked about that the body might behave as if it were a tensegrity structure when it's properly aligned. Hmm. Right. I that, see. That was her, that was her concept. Um, so alignment was the leading thing and uh, the, the famous uh, posters that they have with the sort of the stack of blocks type of thing. So that was the, the that, that was the straight is good. That was the primary understanding. Exactly. A straight was good and that when it is properly aligned, then it, it might function as if it were a tensegrity structure. Okay, so and it was this critical as if it were in a which sets a different tone there. That's okay, so we'll definitely get back to this, okay. to the distinctions of different as if it, right. and what is real, and what we, what, 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 what is this, what is the kind of the depth of the model that we undertake. But let's get through this. You are speaking to the physiatrist with the Rolfing right. connection and discovering the new connections there, and what other interesting tangents were happening at the time? Well, so, so I'm developing a concept. In those days, we had 35 millimeter um, Kodachrome uh, slides. And so I was using, I was doing a slide presentation using the slide technique. And I eventually graduated to two slide projectors going at the same time. So it was a, you know, a major production, but we're, anyway, it was just, developing the concepts and getting critiqued back a little bit. Okay, but an interesting point, you know, speaking of the development of the concept, so how would you describe, let's say, from the first insight, let's get anywhere from three to five or maybe even more of the, like, subset, the extra kind of twists which, and, like, mini clicks maybe that made it oh that's you know because you see you first get an idea you say oh it's an eureka moment but then once you start connecting it to the other things you you either feel the resistance or you feel the clicks yes it fits and this fits in and this fits in and then at a certain point you get the critical critical number of those fitting in things right right so well, well certainly the the surgical testing i did reinforce the the understanding of these uh, structures as a as a continuous tension discontinuous compression concept mm -hmm. that fuller emphasize it. and so i was using that concept and developing it and i also recognized how it, how it was created through the close uh, close packing of foam like structures uh, thinking in, in the concept of cells. So it evolved from that and developed further from that. So uh, that was, so meaning that, so first point was taking it from the spinal structural image without anatomical consideration. Then moving to the, you know, then integrating the extremities with, the, but you see, but I'll want to get back to this a bit more. So integrating the extremities very much in this line, continuous tension, discontinuous compression. Yeah, well, I, I went back to Grant's book and saw that uh, him, him demonstrating in that forearm thing, mm -hmm. where the where the forces went through the tensional structures. So it demonstrated that the, the force goes into the hand and through the the radius, and then through the interosseous ligament and then back up into the ulna and then again the forces in the shoulder had to be all tensional forces as well going to the axial skeleton. Okay. And that and actually he does things that, again that are not mathematically sound. He shows a shear, shearing going at the glenohumeral joint with the mm -hmm. uterus. And of course, there can't be any shear. It's a frictionless joint, and you got a small socket there. So any force would have to be just, you know, it has to be directed normal to that joint. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, normal and, to the joint means perpendicular, right? right. So perpendicular. It's just to kind of be perpendicular to the joint, and 
and, if, and that wasn't depicted as such, but clearly the force were going into the scapula and the scapula hangs off the chest wall or the other way around, the chest wall hangs off the scapula if you're a quadruped. Mm. Uh, so so I knew that there was not a bony connection that took forces from the hand and passed it through the axial skeleton. That means it, you, we, all those compressive forces that are described in literature just couldn't exist. It had to work another way. And then if you get down to the pelvis, he, Grant also depicts that as the sacrum hanging between it, so the wings of the ilium. So again, it's the a, wings of the ilium. The okay. wings of the ilium. So literally speaking, of the wings. The wings of the ilium. So you're hanging there. So the pelvis is hanging. And again, thinking of a quadruped, the pelvis. That means the sacrum and the whole trunk and the body are falling out of the wings of the ilium. And when you look at the upright, I mean. It, if we look at it from a pure, just G-force perspective, as right. if they were falling out, right? Right, and, and if even the upright pelvis of a walking human, the sacrum actually hangs anterior and inferior to the wings of the ilium. As opposed to the keystone. As opposed to, it has nothing to do with the keystone. And Grant points that out specifically. He says it is not a keystone. It is the reverse of the keystone. Okay, so... I think that we are touching on, on a number of important things, right? So first of all, Grant, this is 11th edition in from the 1980s. So what we we kind of getting back to you were actually studying your during your medical school studies, you were using the Grant's method, method of anatomy. anatomy. Right. So one of the earlier editions from the 1950s. Right. So one of the things that I must say that I remember from my Russian textbooks as, as, as well is that, you know, it was actually quite amazing the difference in writing style of the medical textbooks of the 1940s and 50s compared to the ones that came, let's say, in the 80s and later. So it was much more you know, human in a way, description, I would say, and very, yeah. very, you know, I would say even, you try to read it today, it's, it's, it's much easier to understand, you say, so it's kind of, it communicates. Now, uh, the, now the old one. No, the old ones. Oh yeah, no, Grant, Grant's book no, uh, still is the most readable uh, anatomy book there that's is. That's it, that's my point, so the, 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 the things were much more readable. Yeah, he, he talks it as a story and a readable thing and asks questions and questions things and discusses it. It isn't just a description of the anatomical structure as they are. So he talks about things like that. That He also had an atlas, but that was strictly, you know, he has a picture of it and he had the bones and he had the muscles. So in that sense, it's the method of anatomy which actually makes the most important companion oh, yeah. oh, for that for Absolutely. That understanding. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, as I said, it's, it's a classic book that continues to be a classic book. Uh, and continue, as I said, it keeps going through new editions. Um, but it's, it's a readable book. Any, anybody with any scientific bent could pick it up and read it as a book. You don't even, you know, you don't even have to do the anatomy with it. You just read it. So in that sense, it also reflects those primary tendencies and focuses that medical you know, profession had at the time. Because we already had these multiple conversations with you that at the, in the 50s, the first and foremost thing that you were trained and zoomed into being the clinical examiners and physical examiners, observationists, and so on. So where even the lab tests you couldn't just order a slew of rap tests, right. you had to do it yourself. Right. So you had to be... <laughs> right. It would, uh, as opposed to what we have today, when the, it's the visual image, instrumental data first, and then the whole descriptions and the anatomy books and so on. wasn't even dry so you would go down you know if you had an x-ray and wanted to see it right away you would go on and they'd be picking it out of the solution and showing up the wet x-ray film you know big film 
and then they would dry out and you'd be looking at it. But it's not, I mean, it's not the subtleties of, of the images that we can see today. So it, a clinical examination was much more important at that time. Well, it was the leading thing. It was the thing, yes. So you were first and foremost was clinically oriented. Right, and, and I said Grant's method asked these questions, and it's interesting, the anatomy people, the pure anatomists, don't get into the mechanics very much, except by just mentioning this stuff, you know, this is considered as a lever and uh, things like that. But they, you know, when a question like that arises in the book, he doesn't get into it and say this is a really a problem. Mm -hmm. He just talks about it. You know, oh, here it is. <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't, he doesn't recognize the challenge that it presents. Because if you are saying that it's a tensional thing that's going through the arm and then through the shoulder, and there are no, and then the pelvis, there are no more levers in that system. You can't get a lever force from the hand into the axial skeleton. It, it doesn't work that way. In, in a way that there is no like straightforward there's, bony continuity. There's no bony continuity. There's no fulcrum where mm. you can have a lever. You know, and that's a basic mechanical principle. You know, you can't have a, a lever without a fulcrum. And by no having no bone on bone contact, you can only pull on it. You can't torque it. Mm. So, but I think that that's an important thing, and we really have to get there because you see, on this is one of those things that I find the most interesting about around the whole field. It's like it's not the continuous train of thought, it's just like a train of thought that goes, 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 then the moment it goes into a relatively opaque area, something happens there, it then disappears into the tunnel, and then it reappears. Nobody cares what, you know, like, if there's something happening in the tunnel, some robbery happens into the nobody tunnel, cares. nobody cares, you know, it was, it's yeah. one, one train that went to the, into the tunnel, the other train appeared out of it, Nah, okay. There's a black box with a mystery going on in it mm. between one end and the other. And even the separating the anatomist from the physiologist is, is there's a decision. They don't, they don't seem to, to talk to one another at times. There's a transition point where, you know, oh, there's some mystery that occurs within this black box and we don't know about it. We don't care about it. That's the other part of it. They stop caring about it because it doesn't affect the anatomy dissection as they do it. They, they're, they're describing things, that's all. But, so in, so in that sense, what, I, what I'm seeing here, it's, a, it's a just, I think we should dig maybe a little bit more into this. Because, you see, that's one of those, these are the two connected things. On the one hand, we have the descriptive anatomy, which is actually the basis of the profession. So right. the more you dig in, the more precisely you, you carve the things out and, and uh, the more accurately you label it. So that's kind of what, that's the essence of the profession to begin with, why, when it was the leading profession back then. You know, the, but on the other hand, the functional anatomy is the thing that is then derived out of the primary description based on the kind of common sense and basic engineering ideas. And the way I, 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 I see it is that when things kind of fit in neatly, then it's described. The moment they stop fitting it neatly, it's sort of, okay, let's just go on. You know, the biceps as a flexor fits neatly. Right. You know, you're lifting the weights, it's okay. The shoulder blade is a kind of strange thing that just kind of hangs there. You don't really understand what it's doing and it's like it's really out of the out of the obvious continuity there in terms of the train. So here you talk about compression, then you know you move into the you know the axial system based on the compression with some guy wires, then suddenly you get the connected tensional system plugged into it. Who is the lead, who is in the lead? Who is in the assistance? You know, it's kind of all 
blend blurs there. Grant in his book has a drawing of a uh, an outline drawing, a cartoonish drawing of some uh, somebody on the parallel bars doing a handstand on the parallel bars, with this, you know showing showing the body is hanging from the the tension of the muscles in the shoulder girdle, and he has an E and has the person wearing a little hat. Okay. But, but it's, uh, and that's been in his book since it it was in it was in it before he even published the book. It was in his his initial drawings when he was teaching it in in the uh, University of Toronto. So he so this concept is there but never explained and it's not explained in his book. He brings it up, is brought up in the but nobody discussed it when we were doing the anatomy dissection. So you mean in in that respect, even if we speak about Grant as one of the kind of forefathers of modern anatomy and the one who became the classics and so on, so he had a significant tensional focus there, if we put it this way. Clearly, he had he recognized at least three areas in the body where there were this significant tensional uh, focus, where there was not a continuum of bone on bone. So that would be the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle, and the, forearm. And, and the forearm. So this was even in his textbooks with a big focus. Big focus. Okay. Clearly stated, you know, he clearly stated it, he made a point of it. But it was never discussed in anatomy and never discussed again in, in orthopedics. So the focus returned to bone on bone kind of connection. And then it was bone on bone. Well, well, but you know, we shouldn't be surprised because of course when you look at it from these different tangents, you've got the biomechanics which technically speaking only emerged at the end of the 60s, right? So you see you've got the pre dated tradition of the orthopedic carpentry, right? And we've got the anatomical di dissection and so it's all but these are all different branches and, and brands. It, it, what, later on in the 80s when I started speaking to biomechanics people, mm -hmm. I would bring up these problems to them. Okay. And they would say things like, well, I've studied the knee, I don't know anything about the forearm or the shoulder, or vice versa. I've only studied the other. So the biomechanics people don't seemingly, from my discussions with them, are very good anatomists. But they aren't very good anatomists. No, they don't, they, they, you know, they look at a structural thing, they do what is known as a free body diagram where they isolate the particular structure and they look at it as, as if it is what they want to see. And they don't continue their connections with it. So, that when they talk about forces in the forearm, they completely, sometimes they only represent the forearm as one bone instead of two. Just for convenience sake. For convenience sake. They don't include the wrist. Mm -hmm. And when they are talking about the muscles, they only pick the muscles that they want to function in it. So they will use the, say, the biceps muscle. And the triceps. And the triceps muscle. But then they also they forget that there are a whole bu a whole slew of muscles that cross the elbow that affect the function of the wrist, and they don't even talk about that as as possibly affecting the 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 what they would consider the talk around the elbow. Okay, but that is you see I think that you're touching on a really important spot because you know we are kind of in this very interesting territory. On the one hand, because we need to find this, the right kind of the middle ground, how much aggregation and how much detail, right? Because on the one hand, people, you know, the, the one of the arguments which people have difficulties with in taking the bite and segregate in is exactly this point that it seems that, well, it's a bit, it doesn't, it's, it's a model, it's not, it, there are too many, not enough details there. Going back to the, to the late 70s, mm. 
what was these things, all these things were coming up in my mind and reinforcing that the biomechanics that had been taught to me were wrong. That's what these were doing for me. That I would, I was going back to the things that were questionable in my mind and realizing that these people who were simplifying the biomechanics and telling me that this is a lever that goes to this and this muscle does that really didn't understand what was happening. Okay, so uh, let me reframe this into a nicer way, right? So, so because, <laughs> okay. You know, into a nicer way because, you know, we, we are in the day and age when the word wrong is not really ringing very well. So, but let me, let me put it this way, right? So basically what you are saying is that the level of the aggregation and the quality and the, and the level of math, the basic engineering math, that was that is used in the biomechanical assumptions is not really m meeting accurately the complexity of the system being studied very nicely put so that's why the assumptions they tend to be oversimplified for the sake of being uh, able to use the conveniently established engineering math and whatever doesn't fit into it is then kind of being omitted until the whole model fits and then once the model fits it gets the seal of approval and then afterwards the little details are being injected into it but without kind of challenging the model itself that's correct so that's what I see there and right. your message your message to the to yourself actually in the first place yes this you, was this was your yeah. message to your fir to first to yourself was that well, the details and the links that are being omitted are essential. Right. They can they matter. They matter. You can unless you include them. You know, you if you don't include them, you get the assumptions which are too oversimplified and they are inaccurate. So that's why we need to get more. Accurate, well, I mean, like the next level of complexity integrated and see how that because those tensional elements from Grant's anatomy that you're describing, it's like different, you know, it's like trails, right? Yeah. So they are there, but depends on how these trails, where do they link, right? So you see, do they connect what road do they, do they connect? Right. To? So what happened was that I then said, well, whatever Grant is talking about would fit into this tensegrity model that I've now been working on. So I saw that, hey, wait, I can explain Grant's problems by looking at a tensegrity model. So I then start looking at all those structures as if they were a tensegrity model, and I kept challenging it, trying to fit one into the other, and the problem, any problem that I could challenge, because now I was refining these things, I said, so any problem that I saw that I could say, well, look at this joint and mm. could this function in okay. a tensegrity model and could it function in a lever model? Mm. And it always come up that the, the superior answer was a tensegrity model. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll definitely need to get into this. Let me, let me just highlight even more. So, we'll probably need to find that picture from Grant, right? So you see from that early picture, we have, you have it somewhere. It's, it's in the book. Oh, okay. It's the same so, one. See, he hasn't changed. Those haven't changed. Okay, so we'll book. find that, that, that. So effectively, what, we has, what, what I think that what we are talking about here is that originally, as always, he had some special cases, you know, basically show the girdle, pelvic girdle, forearm and there is so these are the special cases which naturally and we have to consider that was prior to biomechanics prior to this type of indoctrination so which he felt were best treated under the tensional assumption so those were the special cases yes but the people at the time were actually not really concerned too much with the you know, consistency and continuity of applying the same methodology throughout the entire 200 plus joints, right? So you see, basically say, okay, these three complexes, they fit well, 
But then at the same time, that same person would say, okay, but I think that the spine would go into the compression model. Right. So they kind of coexisted there in that representation, right? In some ways, yes. Well, they would. They never really considered this, let's say the forearm model that he had, they would think of it as one unit, mm. as a bone, together. So they wouldn't recognize that there was a... You know, You're talking about the biomechanics. The bi biomechanics. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm getting, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm rewinding oh. back to oh. Grant. Oh, Grant, yeah, you know, Grant I, recognized I, that these were... Yeah, that's it. So I'm... You saw them as... as that's it. So, it's deviating from the standard model. You see, that's what I'm saying is that I'm, but in that, my, what, the way I have it, the feeling there, you know, Grant, 1930s, 1940s, right? So that's before the establishment of the biomechanics as a discipline, right? right? So he says, and the biomechanics as a discipline is a systematic application of engineering to the human body, you know, using the engineering math for the human body. So, at that point, there was a lot more fragmentation and freedom. So, from the common sense, I believe, told Grant okay. that, well, if there is no obvious bone continuity, let's, you know, see it as the tension element. So, those, those would be special cases. But at the same time, that same Grant would happily look at the spine as a column. Yes. So, yeah. in, a, in that respect, the tensional approach and column, compression, they would coexist there. Yes. So, and, but because that's a medical profession when you don't expect, you know, like the methodological continuity, you are happy to do the patching, <laughs> a patch here, a patch there, so it's a patchwork. So nobody really was bugged by this patching. No. So that's why when you came into this in the 50s, it was still a very fragmented, fragmented field without a dominant leading like umbrella over it that it has to be it has to fit into the equations there was not it, and most of that's still missing yeah but, way. but certainly then it, was, hmm. it wasn't any, any recognition so it was just a patchwork you know it's a competing ideas here we apply tensional here we apply compressional so basically whatever fits whatever helps the practicing practitioner to get a better idea of how to get the practical, whatever, surgical and physical procedures. Right. So I think that that's very important because it's like we effectively, we go to a conventional textbook, right? We go to a con mo super conventional, super conventional, super it conventional textbook, which, but as we rewind back in time, we see the plurality of opinions, right? And that kind of original soup, there were tensional components there and there were compressional components there in that soup. But the problem is that when, you know, by the 1960s, a greater formalization came, the compression, the, the column systems, the math for it is much easier and much, much you know, the basic math has been like 200 years old by that time. So it's much better established. So you basically just can apply the standard formula. So what I see there is that actually we are extracting this information that original, it was basically the thing could have gone either way. It could have gone into the tensional lead. Yeah, sure. It could have gone because there were seeds there. Right, but there was no model for it. That's it. So, but what appeared first were already convenient equations with the numeric solutions from the biomechanics and that's how, that's where the things became relatively sort of sealed and crystallized and then it became the gospel and, and so on and so forth. So now the tensional elements they kind of get as a subset of the compression model and, and the lever and so on and so forth. I see that is really, really interesting that we kind of got that far and saw those seeds of the, to which we can hook. So effectively you were connecting in your mind, you were not doing anything unconventional. You were not kind of challenging the established tenets of the biomechanics because no, for you was, they were not established. Right, and I was just interpreting what I That's saw it. in the standard textbook. So, that, I, so in, that, that, to me. in that respect, you were actually not, you didn't even feel yourself as a kind of groundbreaker no. or earth shaker or anything no. like this. You said, well, you know, I learned this thing in the 1950s. You know, that made sense to me. 
that connects to my practical experience and I see that all the specifics of the of those girdles right then in 1960s came these guys with their equations I wasn't so impressed this kind of still speaks better to me right. and then then in 1970s came the integrity model which connects better to my 1950s experience it was that simple I mean, basically, if, right, if right. we deconstruct it this way, it's that simple. So it's like there was no internal, because you see, I think really it's important that the people who are trying to get into the biotensegrity today, they feel that they have to go against the grain, right? That they have to get against the established beliefs, right. that they have to be the revolutionaries who are actually questioning the... 50 years worth of established biomechanics work and so on and so forth but as we wind the clock back that wasn't the thing for you at all so you were actually right because i was looking at a tensional system and say you know this fits the tensional system i wasn't making it you know i'm explaining what i saw <clears throat> in grant's method anatomy and it just worked so i didn't need and not, not only that, I then moved and said, well, what are those things that they're explaining as levers, you know, could I put them into the tensegrity system and it worked better? Mm. At least for me, in my mind it worked better because well, well, it was more yeah, We'll get system. to this, yes. You know, so it wasn't, you're right, I wasn't, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was just explaining the findings that were in Grant's method. Yeah, but because I think it's it's a really important touch because you know people at this point of time might say, well, who the hell is this guy who is kind of raising the flag and trying to you know overthrow 50 years of the biomechanics tradition, you know? And if we skip, roll the clock back, for you it doesn't, especially at the time, it never felt like that. You were actually feeling that you were connected to the, you know more original source and you were looking at the biomechanics which was kind of taught to you later and introduced that with a skeptical eye and say guys you know you're not really showing me much of the connection with the reality so i feel much more connected to this uh, you know to the grant's method of another so like to to that to that tradition All right. Videos on, my friends, if you like. And if you want to, um, we've got enough people here. So um, maybe using raised hands would be a good idea. Um, if you're, you know, if you've got a comment. Um, I just, I just love this video. It's just got such a great punchline there at the end. Uh, Leonid, your camera is fixed. No. No, it's that's fixed. just it, a different it, it, It's a snapshot again. Ah, but Leonid, you did such a great job of, um, of, of bringing out that punchline. I love it. Which particular punchline? Uh, at the end, when you're, when you're saying, you know, so it's not like Steve was like, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah, of course. Let's, I'm going to take mean, these biomechanics guys down. I'm going to cause trouble. Da, da, da. It was just, it was just following a thread that had begun back when he was uh, learning Grant's anatomy. No, yeah, but I actually like after rewatching this episode, I think that if if anything, maybe this is one of the episodes that we can kind of even popularize more because uh, I do think that this is really essential. Right, is that, and uh, we have to remember how much, kind of the, the the looking back, the lens changes. So that this is really like very important to understand the context. That you know, if you really put it in in order, those books, you know, the from 1930s, then 1950s, and then in 1960s show up the biomechanists with their, you know, at the time when everything got. 
kind of formalized and so on. And uh, well, you know, 1970s were just 10 years later than 1960s, right? So it wasn't that much. And yeah, from yeah. that perspective, I can't tell you how many people um, after watching these have come back and said, wow, I didn't realize biomechanics was such a, you know, that it was such a new idea. In other words, that it just kind of like came out of nowhere that it, I mean, we talk about Borelli in 1680, but it's not like there was a continuous thread of biomechanical development from 1680 to the 1960s you know what i'm saying it was just sure, kind sure. Of, yeah so i think that's that's great uh bob you've got comment question bob's coming in from baltimore right yes coming in from baltimore no i mean i i appreciate um Lainey's viewpoint I and mean, what it brought to me was the idea of you know, specialization versus the generalist. And if you read some of the old medical texts, you're getting more of a general perspective of the entire body, you know, old osteopathic texts or Métis still versus, you know, everything now is just uh, standardized. So to me, that just dovetails everything that Leonoid prayed in. And, um, you know, it, I just, uh, you know, appreciate that comment. It made a lot of sense to me. That's great. And Craig, Nevin, I see you, you put in this, um, pre-classical biomechanical text uh, information. I, I like the way you put that. Did you want to say anything, Craig? Yes, um, my experience is I did uh, engineering before I did biomechanics. So I was working with surgeons before I did biomechanics. And as an engineer, it made no sense. It was it was very applied mathematical. It was no, it wasn't applied to anatomy at all, and so a lot of my research, the early works um, before it became biomechanics, were very, very interesting and very, very accurate. Um, for example, I uh, were doing foot pressure measurements at seventy hertz, way right before electronics came along, uh, and all sorts of interesting fundamental research and just not get swept up into the applied, applied mathematics or biomechanics. And so I've got, um, this is one of my fundamental texts of your observation, we observe the anatomy and explain it. It's not based on computerized algorithms and mathematics, it's just a pure observation and that, obs observation of the anatomy and that's key to uh, a new understanding, but it's not really a new understanding, it's just looking at fresh or looking at what's there. And that's that's where I've got in my knowledge from, is just looking at the anatomy without any preconceived notions. And there's a lot of texts before the First Second World War that give very good insights. Great. Thanks, Craig. Um, Carol? Yes, greetings, everyone. And I love this. I, I loved hearing about the history. But Steve, I have a question for you. Um, when I put myself in your place, as I hear you talking about what it was like, that you were you were on to something, and you were hoping that somebody would would confirm that what you were saying made sense, or that that you could read or or hear from some other source something that that united things, pulled things together in more of a of a holistic way. Um, and then you said, well, I, I started to talk to some physical therapists. And I know that you that you you and John Barnes were together in Philadelphia with Mc McNell um, for a while. And I know that John Barnes picked this up um, in a way that he had you write a chapter in his first textbook that came out in the um, late 80s, early 90s. And so I wondered if you would comment if you thought that Barnes was one of the physical therapists who kind of understood what you were talking about. And of course he was also out on the edge and being criticized for his own, for his own um, ideas that were going against the grain. Yeah, John was one of the very few who picked up on this. I just, for some reason or other, I was just out there doing my thing. And 
I, I didn't really get a, a high level of anxiety about it. I just kept doing it because it was obviously right. And my anxiety was internal. I was having problems. I developed then to start having problems doing surgery because I couldn't put the two together as to what I was doing. But it, it, I talked to these physical therapists and hardly any of them really picked up on it. They were polite to me because I would send them patients to for them to deal with. And, you know, it was something to listen to, it was new, but hardly any of them have picked up on it. As you well know, I have no idea why the physical therapists haven't gotten more into this. But John, of course, was one who did. And that was an interesting little thing we did in, in Philadelphia when I had John Minnell and, and John Barnes and a couple other people bouncing back and forth. Uh, but of the whole group, I, I then started speaking to the osteopaths a lot. And we got into with the osteopaths and even the senior osteopathic people listened to me and were polite, but never really got it because they came to it from a different aspect. It was only the newer ones who would begin to appreciate it. Uh, then some of those picked up on it, as I think we, we talk about later in some, some of the future uh, uh, sessions. So uh, they did sort of get it, but not, a, not as many as I thought would at the time. Right. Any follow up, Carol? No, I just, um, I just am very, very grateful that um, you um, invited John to that big meeting uh, in Washington in 2015, and he couldn't go, and so he asked me to go, and um, I was uh, very, very busy at the time. <laughs> I thought, I don't think I can add a couple extra days here. And um, and I wrote to Susan and, and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe that I can do this. And, and I told John and John wrote back. He said, I want you to go to this and I want you to talk to them about why what we do fits what they're doing. But you have to be there to see and hear what they're doing in order for you to understand that. And so he had to practically, and, and then I, I wrote Susan back and said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, can I take back my refusal? And Susan said, oh, sure, you're welcome. everybody's welcome. And um, made me feel so at home. And, and uh, I didn't, um, I, 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 from that moment on, I was in love. It was just, and then I, I was on your case because I said, you've got to start incorporating this concept of energy flow. And you said, oh, yeah, 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 it's there. And, 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 and then one day you came in with some slides and said, okay, Carol, now we're going to talk about this energy flow business. <laughs> and um, it was um, it was fun. We were, we were having fun together um, from all different perspectives. Um, and backgrounds. And I was just so grateful that um, that it was just one of those instances where I tried to walk away from a peak experience. I've had three or four of those in my life and been hit over the head and said, dummy, come on, wake up. This is this is really important. And um, and I'm really, really glad that um, I did it. And, and since then, my life has just my my treatment life, my understanding, my appreciation has just magnified. Um, I just uh, I can't imagine thinking about fascia without thinking about biotensegrity. They they're just you're they're you can't get them apart. That's great. So thank you, Steve, and thank you, Susan. Such a pleasure, and we would love to have um, John Barnes on a tea party if he's ever up for it. You could do the interview, Carol. That would be a great one. I certainly will in, uh, um, offer it to him. He's recovering from a tremendously uh, near-death experience last October. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry to hear that. He, um, yeah, he he fell and uh, wasn't able to move, 
and uh, went through um, a kind of renal breakdown, a kidney, um, you know, breakdown. He wasn't found until he fell about seven in the morning and he wasn't found until about 630 at night. Oh, God. By then they had to get him on dialysis. Right. And then it's just been a very slow road. But he's come back and he's uh, he's got, getting some strength in his voice now. And he's attending the seminars and teaching again in Sedona. I don't think he's flying. But uh, he's back, and so um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, because you never he... want such a horrible thing to happen to anyone. Yeah. But when it happens to somebody with such an incredible understanding of mm -hmm. of how bodies work, yeah, he knew what was I happening. I then become yeah. very, very curious about how that unusual set of information that they have guided their recovery process. Right. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, if you read his second book, um, uh, you, you, you recognize he, as a young child, he was out in the woods a lot and he, 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 he just listened to the, to um, the, the, the ancient warrior is what she, he calls him. It's an Indian kind of image. John is um, several years older than I am. So he's, he's up there. And, um, but he he uh, lost his father when he was young, and so as a three year old, he um, he was in the woods a lot. His mother didn't uh, pay a lot of attention to him and let him kind of have his have his own freedom. And he learned to be very very intuitive, and he would he would lose himself in the woods, and then challenge himself to be able to find his way home. And that was a kind of a metaphor, I think, both for Steve <laughs> losing yourself in the midst of you go into surgery and you say, okay, now what? I know this, but I've learned this. And this is what I see in front of me. How do I put all this together? But John has a very well-developed uh, intuitive and very wise um, uh, and loving heart. So I'm, I'm just really, he's a very dear friend and I'm glad he's still teaching and still contributing and writing too. And I will, I will, um, I will suggest to him that he um, that he might be interested in doing something like this. But I think that what Susan meant is also beyond all, all that is that actually, I mean, it sounds a bit like intrusion in privacy, but having the inside perspective of their this kind of entire eight months journey from the person who is tuned in would be really incredibly valuable as in compared to their, you know, uh, regular octogenarian who fell and uh, right. Right. sort of uh, then just complained until his uh, grandchildren found him. So yes. I think that that, that, is, the, that is the part which, uh, which uh, you know, trying to turn this unfortunate set of events into kind of yet another reflection, the inside perspective, that would be really quite amazing in that sense. Yes, especially when what he has told me um, and just little bits and pieces, we haven't had a long conversation. We've been trying to get together that the uh, two days be after he fell, I was there to see him and he couldn't see me in Sedona. Um, but what he said was over the period of months from October until February or March, he had three near-death experiences, out of body and then coming back in. So you know that that is going to be very interesting to hear him tell what that was like and what kind of message he has as a result of that particular um, a set of experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. This is, you know, because... Again, this doesn't happen often to the people who are so articulate, right? So you see, and so tuned in. So if anything, this kind of inside uh, perspective would be worthy of whatever, if we, we call it the Tea Party or whatever other congregation. So that would be really impressive. Pedro signing off. Pedro, good to see you. I just wanted to say something related to, to something else Carol had said. You know, here we are, 20 something people. We've got like nine countries represented here in this small group. After Pedro leaves, it will be eight. But, <laughs> you know, we've got people who are movement teachers, 
manual therapists, biologists, scientists, physicians. We've got a lot of different uh, people of different backgrounds, you know, people who are artists. I'm talking about you, Maggie, because you're such an amazing singer, right? Uh, but but um, and, and also a movement teacher and physical therapist, right? All of <laughs> but I'm just saying I I appreciate the diversity when we come together because nobody has the perfect angle. Steve's been in the game the longest, but nobody's angle can see everything. And so we really need and and appreciate this diversity of of cultural cultural experience of professional experience of life experience so and you had said something about that carol too so i just wanted to hi hosey no uh reinforce that Thank you, Susan, and very good to be here and see you all. And yes, I agree. It's very rich. This various point of views in our and in, uh, in our smaller pod, we've, we've been well. It's been a lot to hear these different points. It's very, it's very rich. And you're right. No one has like the right answer, the the only answer, but it's very rich to view other points of views. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Diane, you want to go ahead? You're going to need to unmute, Diane. Hi, Ang. Yeah, there we go. It's, I've I've now unmuted. I don't have video, but I, um, yeah, uh, I'm off because the host has stopped it. Anyway. I wanted to ask a C, uh, CKC question. Uh, you know, um, Martin speaks about tuning up the body and uh, how this is something that, um, thank you, the, uh, how this is something that is needed. And uh, so when we when we look at the, we talk about CKCs and we we look at these images of the bars all working together and we know that they are changing all the time, uh, obviously because that's part of what happens when we move. So my question is: Do do, do the CKCs get better at their job when we tune up the system? So what's the what's what's the answer is supposed to be? My question. That's my question. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. So no, but look, the thing is, the, the thing is that as any network, right, is in any network, depending on what you're doing, right. So you see, it has, you know, especially if you talk about such a large thing, right. So you see, within it, there are two processes. The process of uh, when it experiences the loads and so on. There are two processes: the process of pruning and the process of sprouting so sprouting means adding the new scales you know kind of traveling through this hierarchical scales and then engaging the additional elements and pruning that's an opposite kind of excluding the elements which were previously uh, in it and that kind of perform in a less effective way right so you see therefore this is basically would be the, the key perspective on understanding the closed kinematic chains. So, and uh, those kind of four bar mechanisms and so on. So there's, this is where it's a continuous process of kind of calibration, pruning and sprouting until they, as they go through the optimization process of reducing the errors. So that would be kind of the technical answer. Oh, okay. Thank you. So when we, <clears throat> what we see in aging, where movement gets, the movement gets smaller, it gets um, and less easy, um, uh, where we lose patterns, we lose and all of that. So that maybe that's part of the pruning that happens with aging. Which is true, because also there are two parts, right? So you see, like, one of the other things is that, you know, 
like different uh, subsets belong to or they shape according to different uh, interactions right and it's also kind of the reversal and kind of rever the reversal from pruning to re-sprouting with aging and the slowing down of the recovery processes becomes less effective so basically you get more stuck and committed to certain ways of doing things so that will be kind of one big thing right and the other big thing which is going to be even bigger because when we talk about the closed kinematic chains as a kind of particular pathways so they would be set within the global set right so you see and in that sense what happens with aging is that the capacity of the global set the constraints that you have you're also kind of losing the total kind of capacity there so therefore your kind of availability of the distribution becomes more squeezed as well. So if you wish, you know, my favorite example actually is thinking about it this way, right? You know, if you visualize that technicalities, that each of us is 1 million square meters of collagen, right? So this is an important thing to guys just visualize. Externally, whether it's Diane, whether it's Susan, or whether it's Leonid, we are roughly three square meters externally but yeah. internally at the level of the micro scale you are your total kind of life capacity is about one million square meters that's a huge multiplication factor and if you kind of take it as a farmland right so you see you start with you know one million square meters of farmland within those three square meters of surface and then gradually you know you kind of keep harvesting it keep trying to get but you know as you age some of that farmland gets lost right so you see and uh, at the same time also the yields that you can extract out of this farmland also get smaller right so you see that's basically what the process of aging is and uh, at some point when you know it gets critically lost then uh, you know there's not much left right so but that's that's a general principle to understand how large you are right and uh, that basically this is where we where everything plugs in yeah, yes thank you very good i i very much like the pruning and um and and so forth such um sprouting so, yes sprouting thank you word thank you um so um uh as we work with the elderly using movement and um working to build that rebuild rebuild that um uh real estate so to speak right yes. that's there then um uh that's that's kind of where i'm going with this because i'm developing some material in that way and um uh and uh so anyway that's good i uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it, it's it's a kind of running a rec, uh, 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 an, uh, land reclamation project, right? <laughs> Please, we, yes, but a biological reclamation project. Of course, of course, of course. You know, let's see, but doing it in reclamation, not in a chemical way, right? But just trying to kind of reconnect to some natural reserves. Yes. Yes, movement through movement. Great. Um, Bob, go ahead. I know you've done some of this work too. He needs to be unmuted. Yes. Huh. Yeah, no, I, sorry about that. Yeah, 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 unmuted. Um, I have done some of this work. I mean, is a, I mean, I am a, a manual physical therapist. I also have a background in physiology, so I wanted to tap into this to some things Leonoid said, and, and because it, it, I guess some of my questions come in. I mean, certainly you see changes with ages. Um, but a lot of that is related to physiological changes and how much of that is related to tissue hypoxia from lack of movement or tissue hypoxia based on you know, dysfunction, which is they're allowing to get things. And then all of a sudden, do you have decreased cellular function because of the hypoxia? And then you have decreased in you know, mitochondrial development, and so which can lead to a whole sorts of things which they're finding in research with like neurodegeneration and everything else. So it's... <clears throat> 
there is an aging process, and I think there's a, a cumulative dysfunction process as well as which leads to a lot of things, and it's all intertwined, which makes it both fascinating and complicated at the same time. Susan, you are muted. Muted. I think you got cut off at the end, Bob. Did you? No. No. Mm -hmm. I said it. Okay. No, I finished. But you see, frankly, I you know I'm still thinking about the content of the of of, of the video, and and really, it's it's such an interesting thing, right? Is that like if you talk about the say pre-scientification or partial scientification and this discussion about the you know like when Steve during that particular meeting brought uh, the Grant's method of anatomy and also the illustrations you know with references which go with details right so you see which go with details into their uh, kind of tensional concepts and all this, you know, the transitions and the septa, which divides the, the ulna and the radius and so on. It's very technical in a way. But you see, the thing is that mathematically, tension is very difficult to treat. Right? So you see, compression is much more convenient thing to be treated mathematically. And the point is that, you know, we kind of come back to this, to this thing. You see, what we were discussing there, right, is that that say Grant himself has been happy with the patchwork. So okay, you know the vertebral column, let it be the compression structure because it looks like a compression structure. But then you know okay, the the show the girdle particularly for the person on parallel bars or for the quadruped and so on, it doesn't look like being supported by anything compressional. Okay, so make it tensional. But there is an understanding of ubiquity, right? Ubiquity means that if it's a, and that's where we kind of get to it, if it's one organism that develops continuously or consistently without interruption, which is interruption would mean death, right? So there has to be ubiquity. So something that we see in one area or assume in one area, it has to be extendable, extendable into other areas and into other scales. So that's kind of what I find a very important Leonid, part. Leonid, because let me let me just say what you're saying in a slightly different way. Because we're starting from one cell, right? Developmentally right it has to be there because it's always been there it's not like we're developing we're developing we're developing and then in some section some fundamental um aspect of the process disappears is that what you yeah what i mean is that this is a you know that the, if we if we find a certain type of the physics or which we associate right so you see like a tensional tensional type of the force transfers right so that means that the same logic has to be applicable elsewhere right so you see if we assume that there is tension like transfer works for the connection between the radius and the ulna so now we have to challenge ourselves and say okay we made a partition into 200 bones and whatever other names but what would be the way how those elements at least could be interacting in a tensional way right because then you see like if you start thinking in a tensional way everything flips right because basically if you think in a compression way you pay primary attention to the vertebral bodies right and the discs in between thinking okay that's a nice column and then there are some kind of spinous processes just there by the way right but if you start thinking in a tensional way you say oh by the way maybe this kind of behaves like a fish fin to begin with and it's the actual tensional connection that is going through 
the spinous processes, which is actually the primary link that goes through the so-called vertebral column. And then it's not a column at all, right? So you see that this kind of approach starts bringing you even before you start kind of going to the higher levels of tensegrity per se, but you start kind of questioning, okay, how come that we do this patchwork? This is tensional and this is compressional. So you have to, you know, this thing in itself has to start challenging you towards the question, okay, what else we can interpret in a tensional way? And in that sense, the reference to this Grant's method of anatomy as a kind of precursor of the more uh, sort of of the later work is, is a very good route, if I wish, if I would were to say that. A potential to recognize the organism as a tension governed system. Yeah, but okay, so that's what exactly that what Craig is commenting on, right? So you see that compression and the systems which because compression systems are additive. So that means that it's easy to divide them into parts and study them there, right? So it's, it's a very convenient math. So while the tension systems, they are multiplicative, so therefore they are not readily divided, so they are difficult to treat. So and when Grant was doing this according to common sense, Mm -hmm. So that was fine, right? But to make it kind of digitized, uh, it's not easy, right? So you see, especially or well, like con if convert it into something computational and actually to make sure that your computation actually holds. So that is that is a very interesting thing for me. I mean, like th that particular, if we get back to this episode. So I do find that this, this is a very kind of, fascinating part and also this whole thing that you know steve didn't come out as a didn't begin this thing as a sort of mega revolutionary who was supposed to ch challenge the established status quo right so that is a it was you know like i mean as we go through it i really love the way how the whole thing kind of works out it's just okay 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s right of course i was born in the 70s you know for me the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s this is well, i mean even the 70s of course you know like i was a kid right so this is something which is very far beyond but you know like now i'm in my 50s and we talk about the new generation of people who are in their 20s 30s and so on for them this is such a remote history but if you kind of flip the thing and say, hey, back then, if we kind of, you know, see that biomechanics brought us nowhere, you know, it brought us to a complete dead end where it sits. So, in fact, you know, the good thing is, OK, let's roll the clock back and kind of get back to the original bifurcation and get started and sort of say, let's have a look what was there before, what, what, what were there potential kind of uh, competitors, right? So you see what concepts were there to which we can root and draw a completely different line, right? So for me, that whole conversation about the Grant's method of anatomy was very, very, you know, was very important because, you know, if we kind of come back now and say, well, it doesn't yield this kind of tensional things. They don't yield themselves very well into uh, into kind of interpretations in, to the kind of more classical mathematization. But nowadays, if you start thinking about them algorithmically and so on, uh, it's a completely different story. So it's a very interesting thing. So yeah. And yes, of course, you know, yes, th that's where Craig is absolutely right. I do, I do believe there has, there is this mysterious component to this, right? That bones persist after death and they make the bone, the, the, it's this mis mi mysterious property, their permanence, which has always fascinated uh, their, the science, right? Especially if we remember that, you know, science to begin with was preoccupied with permanence right 
So what are the permanent immutable laws of universe which Lord Almighty has set and according which to which we have to kind of uh, go on forever? So and it's a lot of things which kind of mix into this. But uh, again, I, I do love this episode because it really gets such a great perspective and also kind of if you wish a sort of a license to restart if but license to restart without being kind of how do i say it without being a revolutionary right without being kind of a radicalist uh, the person who tries to sort of deny the authority and so on and so on basically you just say hey guys okay you know What's the big deal? He wasn't did... trying to be a troublemaker, right, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what's the big deal? 60 years ago, you kind of turned in a bit in the wrong way. Hey, you I'm know. a nice guy. I don't want to start a fight. That's it. <laughs> That's a very simple part. <laughs> He's a lover, not a fighter. So we just roll back, you know? Um, I want to make sure that... Everyone who's, you know, wanted to, to make a comment or ask a question gets a chance to do that. Um, I also want to, let's see, Judith, I think you might be new here. Um, and so at some point, if you want to put in the chat or come online to tell us where you're coming in from and how you found us, we'd love it. Go ahead, Michelle. Can you unmute yourself? hear me yes yeah uh, it's so nice to hear you both <laughs> uh, thank you steve uh, thank you leonie graham susan chris um for me um, um it's a question uh, also of uh, period in uh, uh and also of scale um, and um, because um, a long time ago in France there was um, Xavier Marie Bichat uh, you heard about Bichat who uh, who has uh, written a, a book um, anatomopathologist book uh, who was called um, Traité des membranes you heard about this book it was about uh, fascia in the 18th century he was uh, making dissection uh, in France in the uh, Medicine uh, Academy. And um, this man uh, died because um, he, he did a hundred of dissection. If he, he has um, shown uh, the fascia uh, and he has described uh, the, the membrane, what he calls membranes. So he has. Um, written a very big book um, with called Treaty of Membrane. And um, this book is very well known in France. And um, it, it described the continuity of the, the whole body. And it was in the 18th century. So um, many things has been described and it's uh, depend of the scale. It depends also of um, a uh, dominant uh, frame of thought. I think uh, some um, something dis disappear uh, disappear because uh, it's not uh, uh, good to speak about that. And um, Buckminster Fuller uh, told them um, it was um, a, a big. Uh, it was very sad to uh, observe uh, the hyper specialization um, which is devising um, uh, bi biologists biochemist uh, physician uh, anatomist uh, histologist and in fact if um, uh, research scientific research um, uh, gather these people we find the heterarchy and we find the globality 
of the system. And um, uh, during two centuries after Bishop, did you hear? Do somebody uh, of you uh, heard about Michelle? You will need to send us the link. So that's yeah. and the and the name. So yeah, because... hold on just a sec, Diane. Is this a book you recognize? You're nodding. Um, Bisha, is, um, I can write an, 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 and I sent oh. the name. Jim. Yeah, it would be great if we could put it in the chat. Sorry, Diane, you were muted. I do yeah. recognize. I recognize the author and the date, and uh, that was in, it's interesting to me because I mean, the whole idea of bringing up the whole business of Ida Rolf was just lovely, fine, uh, but there's a much earlier um uh in uh investigation of this material in the body 18th century so, so yes but was, uh, after after bisha after uh in in england there was hunter smith monroe and they did they did the same work about fascia and they, they did um uh, they shown the globality and the tensional network in the body and uh it was um, what uh, still the creator of uh, osteopathy called anatomy because histology is anatomy for the osteopath. Uh, we have not um, uh, the difficulty of the scale. We go from macro to micro uh, all the time in osteopathy. And uh, Andrew Taylor Steen spoke about anatomy when it, he was speaking about histology. And for me, it's very important to um, um, uh, go back to the time security principles because um, uh, when uh, I met uh, Steve in England, uh, the first time he, it was a shock for me because he shown the heterarchy. And uh, it was, uh, for me, it's the most important thing uh, after uh, pre-stress. Uh, there is a hierarchy at all scales, and the globality of the system is there. And uh, it was very sad because after this man, Bisha, who shown so many things, and the um, fascia were there, they were shown, they were described in his book in, in 18th century. Um, then uh, in uh, 19th century and 20th century, the fascia when uh, were thrown in the bin. Michelle, when, can you can you spell the name? I'm gonna see if I can find the book. By E C H A T. Traité des membranes. The book is called in, it's in French. Traité des membranes. Bicha. Could you, could you write it in the chat, Michelle? Um, I try, but I'm not sure. I can. Okay. I, I can send you a mail. I sent you a mail if I don't succeed in the chat because I'm not so good. But uh, I sent you, and uh, I sent you this evening. No problem. Uh, but I want everybody here to have a a chance. So Bisha. I, Bisha. I'll tell you what I found. Okay. Uh, I found something on Encyclopedia Britannica, um, a treatise on membranes. Yes, exactly. by Bichat, B I C H A T. Yes, yes. Okay, so I put a link in the um from Encyclopedia Britannica in the text, and that should be enough to get everybody to find it. Uh, thank you very much. Chat. There we go. Yes. Thank you. That's great. And I, you know, Steve, you've talked about, um, you've talked about Aristotle talking about this stuff. Right? And then it, it just gets thrown away after that. It gets ignored. Uh, Aristotle had it right in his first book. I mean, a book on, on motion of animals, and he pretty well got most of it right. Uh, and certainly we're headed, was headed in the right direction, and it just got lost. And I have no idea why it got lost because even uh, after, I mean, people just used his stuff, you know, were aware of his books and things, but just sort of let it go, and they didn't understand. 
seem to understand it. You know, I, Michelle made a, a comment about them throwing away fashion. I, I just wrote a little note to people that it's the other way around. We have never discarded fashion. Anatomy is the study of fascia. The parenchyma is long gone. So that all anatomy, you know, dissection anatomy uh, on a cadaver is the study of the leftover fascia from the parenchyma. It is the, it is the garbage that the parenchyma have left behind when they died, when it, when it died. So this anatomy, anatomy is all about fascia. It's just they, you know, they took away some of the superficial fascias, but it's still fascia that they talk about. And the study of anatomy is really the study of dead fascia. The problem is that the anatomy people didn't have the living concept to go along with it. So then took this dead fascia and made it work like machines because it was the closest thing they can get to this dead fascia. Mm. But all the spring, you know, you have to understand that as a surgeon, when I think of muscle, I think of something completely different than an anatomist think of muscle. Not only that, I think of it different than the physiologist thinks of muscle. Because we had Jerry Pollack around, who was a muscle physiologist at one point in his career. And he talked about how muscles work in a, when you examine them as, as a physiologist and you take them out of the body and you put them in a machine and you, you test all the, not the way it works in the body. So that when I touched any soft tissue in the body and cut it, the edges would pull apart, except for bone. You break a bone and it overlaps, which means that the bone is under compression and the soft tissues are under tension. You touch muscle in the body and it's a completely different thing than the dead anatomy of muscle because if you cut a dead muscle, nothing happens. It just cuts apart and it's there. But you cut a, you touch live muscle and it contracts and it pulls apart and it tears very easily because it's friable stuff and it's not tough at all. And it's, you know, and neither is the overlying fascia. And so it's completely different. And if you are, are trained as an anatomist doing dissections and not have the advantage of going in and at the surgical table and comparing the two, then you're in real trouble. The problem is that most of the surgeons don't stop and think of what they're doing from the anatomy standpoint. You know, they do, you know, it's an it's anatomy dissection. So I used to do, I, I was fortunate enough to operate with a very famous um, a surgeon in Philadelphia, whose name will remain unsaid, who as we would operate, he would do an anatomy course right there. And you had to name every origin insertion of every piece of tissue you were touching as you went down. But he never thought of the live thing because when you cut those tissues, all sorts of different things happen that's not in the anatomy books. So, I mean, you know, again, we you know, don't think that anatomy is what people are like. It's not like that at all. Off, off my high horse. <laughs> all right. Um... We're coming, well, we're past an hour and a half. Um, so uh, any final co thoughts, comments? We've been, this has been really delightful, actually, to see everybody and a great discussion. Well, I think that that's really, you know, it's, uh, I guess we need to do more of the, this type of the conversations and kind of get more in depth and ask, you know, like, because I really love this comments from Steve, right? Because, you know, like for the, what he just brought now is that this, you know, I really love the compact formula, right? So that when you are cutting it through, it pulls apart, you know, and then the bone kind of 
collapses in. So it's just, it's a very simple formula, but it's a very tangible observation. So which kind of uh, leads to a lot of, uh, yeah, it leads to a lot of uh, like trains of thought and conclusions which are coming through. Or so it provides um, a set of questions for the dominant paradigm. Yeah. But, you know, on the good side, right, on the good side is that uh, I feel that, you see, what, like, to put it on a separate tangent, right, on a separate tangent. So what's happening now, right, and you probably all, at least if you were not sleeping under the rock, you can see in the last, you know, like, 10 months, the the whole conversation about the AI has actually, like, skyrocketed right so you see everybody talks about this chat gpt and so on and then you know the dangers of the artificial intelligence and so on but if you look at a little bit you know below the surface if anything this is a really a revolutionary step because you know it shows it will be probably soon seen as a landmark transformation in science because effectively that changes the way how we, you know, we do science, right? Because basically everything without exception that has been uh, done in science before has been coming kind of, if you put it from the left side, it was there. You see, you know, like first, for example, you formulate, this is the ideal gas, and this is the ideal liquid, and this is the ideal solid, and then you try to kind of mix it. And then you see you make some hard gas, right? Super compressed one. And then, you know, so basically you put the uh, integer, right? So you see like, if you try to do the pi, right? The relationship between the, the square and the circle. So you start with a three, and then from a three, you know, you do the first decimal, 3.1. Then from that, you do the second decimal, 3.14. Then you do the third decimal, 3.141 and so on. This is how science normally developed, right? But, and that's kind of technically would be coming from the value function. What is it for? What is it doing and so on? So trying to make a hard guess and make it to reality. But now, Technically speaking, what the AI revolution means that we move from their value functions to their loss functions. And the names are terrible. You see, the problem is that the names are terrible. You know, what the fuck is a loss function? Yeah, like it sounds bad even. But the thing is that, in fact, it's the smartest thing ever because this is where what's the main assumption there you see certain processes which happen you see certain cycles you don't guess you make a rough guess start anywhere and then you have a process on how to reduce the errors so in other words you start from the right side you start from the unknown and you don't commit to the left side what would be the exact answer so that is really, I mean, I may be trying to speak very quickly and also you don't even see me, but fundamentally what we have, science is going to change from value function, which we've been doing since Aristotle, into loss function, the error function. So from the left to right, doing it from right to left. And this is like really happening in front of us, which also means good news for all of us, right? Because it sort of legitimizes a complete overhaul, right? So you see of everything conceptual that has been, you know, made in the previous whatever number of hundreds of years. So in that sense, it's a really good thing. So, but I guess I need to, because, but the names are terrible. The names are terrible, so they're completely inhuman. And if you just read them, you wouldn't understand the thing. You know, like, what the hell is a loss function, right? You know, I, who, I mean, who was an idiot who called it like that? So, you know, would you want to 
live in the world which is defined defined by the loss function. But in reality, this is a function which calculates, which basically optimizes the reduction of error. And that makes a complete difference to, you know, like, you know, again, things should change. With that, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Thank you. Great. And I want to throw in post-materialistic science, too, that there's a whole generation now of scientists committed to looking beyond the objectification of data to find out what's true. That they're, they're introducing the concept of that which we can't measure directly, but which we can experience. And how do we frame that experience in a language that everybody can agree on? Well, we don't need to agree on, but this is, you know, you see, look, this is exactly their loss function type, right? So you see, this is where, you know, that's how it works, right? So you, see, you go through the gradients of the optimization. So you don't know what you're going to get. You see, remember, you know, a few months ago when we had this wonderful conversation with you, right? So when you said about the therapist, you know, for the therapist, the key point suspend your outcomes don't commit to the outcomes the first thing is as a physical therapist suspend your outcome and just meet the organism and build suspend, the you know suspend your expectations no even the outcomes right so you see like suspend your therapeutic outcome that was a conversation we had you know in the physical therapist uh, meetings right Mm -hmm. So with Pedro and, you know, Mariana and so on, right? And that, that's when, uh, that's the phrase that I remember from Carol, suspend your out. Uh, and, and that's Barnes. You go in without any expectation. You're in the moment, being present in the moment, allowing the patient or client to present in the moment without expectation and letting go of outcome just for the adventure. So that's loss function, compactly, put nicely, right? So you see, that's your, you, you basically optimize, you know, you, you optimize the gradient and you don't know where it's going to bring you. <laughs> but again, this in before it was in words, now it's in much kind of more fundamental ways. So... And this, so, this came up last Friday in the physiotherapy uh, group that um, Carol and Camilla and Pedro and Mariana and... And Bruna, Bruna's yeah, patient, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, Kimmy. I, well, yeah, I was thinking of people who are here today. Yeah, and Bruna, of course. That, that it's when we can those great teaching and learning experiences come when when we're able to go beyond our expectations or outside of them we're able to let go of them so that something can bubble up emerge emerge mm -hmm. that is a complete surprise and that's you know what's the most um exciting moment for a scientist it's not oh i'm right it's wow i didn't expect that wow that's a surprise because that's the moment where now you've got to go back and look at your assumptions you've got a kind of a fresh slate you've got an exciting new place to explore and start from right Now I wish I could live a hundred more years. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe 80. <laughs> All right. I think I'm going to... Uh, so that, that's a good closing toast, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve, would you mind giving a closing toast? He's Steve, you got to unmute. Sorry. I know. I, I sprung it on you. I didn't... Uh... <laughs> Well, so my toast is really to thank all of you for putting up with, with this discussion that 
Leonid sort of had it, and Leonid thank particularly thank Leonid for putting this all together because that was a hell of a job for her. that took us I don't know how many days. They they sort of lived in my house for a week and just beat me up uh, until I got all these. But without Leonid's organization of the questioning and interviewing me, it would have just been a jumble. So uh, really thanks to Leonid for what he's done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And Graham on the yeah. camera work. And Karen, of course, Graham on the camera work. <laughs> thank you all. And Nelia on the editing. Thank you so much, everyone.